ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם אשר קידשנו בקדושתו של אהרון וציוונו לברך את עמו ישראל באהבה Okay, good morning. Good morning, John. Can you tell us your full name, date of birth, and where you were born? My name is Ellis Cohen, born 26-6-1938, and I was born in Bombay, India. And what's your full Hebrew name? Eliyahu ben Yitzhak HaKohen Yivarech Echa Adonai Adonai Vishmerecha Vishmerecha that uh, I was living with my grandparents, not knowing that my mother passed away when I was only two years old. And I was brought up by my grandparents who were very, very good to me. And the family was together there. How many siblings were you? Uh, three from the, my mother's side and two from my stepmother. So you're, you're all, all boys. Wow. But from my, I believe, uh, from my mother, there was another girl and a boy who passed away when they were young. Right. And what was it like in Bombay growing up to be Jewish? Very good, no problems at all. We were never harassed. Uh, it was a, we had a nice community, all of us together, within, the, within a, mile, a couple of miles radius. Uh, we had a lovely, a big synagogue. And uh, my grandfather, bless his soul, he was a cousin over there for many years till he made Aliyah to Israel. How many generations had the family been in Bombay? Well, how did they get to Bombay? Well, they were all from Baghdad. And they came to Bombay, I suppose. Uh, maybe it was not very safe for them anymore in uh, Iraq. So they moved to Bombay when the, the, the Sassoon family uh, who was very gracious and built synagogues, things like that, made a nice community there, mm. and that's where they all settled. So your grandparents moved to Bombay from Iraq? Yes. So that generation? Baghdad, yes. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, you spoke English? Yes, always spoke English. And what other languages did you speak? You know, it was slang Indian. Okay. Like how you have Yiddish, we had our own Indian mixture of uh, English, Indian, Arabic, all mixed together and, and we spoke. It depends who you were with. Youth, when, as youth, we used to speak mainly English. Mm. But if you were with elderly grandparents and parents, it was a mixture of everything. But not Hebrew? No, not Hebrew, no. No, didn't, didn't know much about speaking Hebrew, but obviously in Shul everything is Hebrew. Yeah. And did your, uh, what, what language did your parents speak as their mother tongue? My, my, don't forget, uh, my, my, I know my stepmother, right? She used to only speak English. 
my father used to have him, he was a multilingual. Indian, Gujarati, Marathi, used to write, Arabic, Persian, he used to speak all those lines fluently, not just you know, a few words, fluently. But in the house, we mainly spoke in English. But if, if he was born in Baghdad, would he? No, no, my father wasn't born in Baghdad, no. There's a, this thing of, about where he was born, whether he was born in Iran, which was Persia then, or in Bombay, I don't know where he was actually born. Right. So you could assume he might have been born in India if he was able to speak fluent Indian. He, he went to an Indian school. He went to Indian school and he learned all Indian school. Not so he was in school. India from when he was very young? Pardon? He was in India from when yes, he was Yes, I suppose so, because I, as I said, I don't know where exactly he was born. Right, okay. Did your, did your family have a trade? Like, what did your grandparents do? What did your what did your Well, my grandparents, uh, my grandfather, from my mother's side, he was a harem. Mm. For many years. So that's where and you get your music from. Well, uh, 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 I was I learned quite a lot from him, obviously. Mm. Uh, observance, not reading, uh, and uh, he was a harder so at a job on his own. Mm -hmm. uh, my father, he was a jack of all trades. In other words, he he was a salesman. He was also I don't want to say that. He was also a bookmaker, illegal, <laughs> illegal. But he was a very clever man, that is no doubt about it. A very, very clever man, and he made his living very easy. So you were in Bombay. Where did you go from Bombay, and how old were you? From Bombay, I went to Israel, and I was only 11 and a half years old. And with me, I took two younger brothers. One was about four and a half, and the other was about two and a half. And uh, we went on the immigration plane to Israel, which was very, very hard. Hardly many seats in the plane. We were all just crushed in there. and not allowed to take a lot of baggage. So we wore two or three trousers, four shirts, you know, just so that we'd have some clothes and not, and not wear suitcases. And I went to Israel. That was it from Bombay. What year was that? 1950? 1950, quite right. Early 1950. Mm -hmm. And that was not with your, that was with your siblings, your younger siblings? Yes, yes. No parents, no one. Uh, and did you go to meet someone there? Who did no, you meet there? no, nothing was completely, nothing to where to go or what to do, but all we was done was, I think I was amongst the first lot of immigrants who were taken to immigration camp. Mm -hmm. Now, if I would have gone a bit later with the youth earlier, then that would have been a different story. They might have taken me straight into some schools or things like that. But instead, it was an immigration camp, and it was very hard there. I had nobody, nobody not many people speaking English there. So you're in Israel with your two younger siblings. You're in this refugee camp. What did you do next? What happened? Did well, you... as I said, there's very few people who are speaking English in the camp. There was mainly from Europe, North Africa, and places like that. And I had to find my way down there, who to get in touch with some officials to see that we will be settled in some schools or whatever. And I did manage to find a place where we had a whole dormitory of kids that they had uh, and uh, sort of a carer for us. And she did speak English. And I spoke to her 
and we managed to get into this dormitory instead of the tents that we used to sleep in. We had a rubbish of broken tents to sleep in. And that's where she started, and I, between us two, and arranged for my brothers to go into the age type of schooling place. Then I said, when I saw they were settled, then I arranged for myself to go as well to different place. Yeah, so we were all three split. Yeah. And you were quite young yourself. Oh yeah, I was about, now by now, that time I was about 12 years old. Yeah, and I don't know if I mentioned this before, but why did you leave Bombay? It was, don't forget, it was just then we got the independence and it was like a fashion, oh, let's go to Israel. All of us pack up and this is how I look at it. But obviously the elders did not think that way because all of them just packed up and went. And uh, I suppose my father must have had it in his mind that if I went on my own with the children, that we will be looked after straight away in the schools or things like that. Rather than be with them, then I, we, I will be their responsibility to settle us down. And that's all I can think of. Mm. So then you entered the school system yeah. in Israel. Yeah. And where did you live? What ended up? Where did you go? No, that there? was like a boarding school. Right? Yeah. It was like a boarding school, but it's not, nothing exactly that. Uh, I had moved to three, four different places before I settled down. Uh, from the immigration camp, I was sent, taken to Carmel in Haifa. Akhuza it was called. It was a very nice place, panoramic view from there. And from there, I was transferred on to Karkur. And from Karkur, I was then taken, sent to just outside Jerusalem, which was called Musad Talpiot. It's not Talpiot of today, but you got there, which is Mossad Talpiot, a big school in the mountain. Very, very nice uh, boarding school. Uh, we learned half a day and we worked half a day for some people around who's got a little farm or carpentry or things like that, all different. And that's how I stayed till the end over there. Did you enjoy it? Huh? Did you enjoy that? Oh, lo I loved it. Best years of my life. Really? Best year, once I got my brother settled, and then it was the best years of my life, enjoying the life of Israel, how things were. Everything was so happy. Every evening we were dancing and singing, all the children together. It was a very nice, enjoyable life. And what type of work did you do? Uh, well, a half a day, obviously after going to shul and breakfast and all, then we used to go to proper classes. Mm -hmm. learning everything proper like any other school and then after lunch in the afternoon we were all sent to different places to work around where we are not far that we can walk and uh, i was sent to an uh, english couple elderly couple's farm and i was doing the farming side of it like putting seeds and grinds plowing uh, things like that Wow. And it was quite good. Like manual labour. Yes, you're right. More or less like that. Yes, yes. And they were very nice couple, elderly people. Right. Uh, and uh, 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 there's a nice story behind one of the things what happened when I was working with them. She gave me some peanuts, and says, "Yeah, yeah, Eliyahu." Grow it, and I, in, in where I was in there, we had a little, I had a little plot of land as well. There was burned, and they dug it, done it, everything. Uh, and next thing I see, oh, lovely! The leaves are coming up, the stems are good, everything nice. Is it great? But no peanuts. And I went mad. I worked so hard on it, and there's no peanuts. So I started taking on and just pulling, as I pulled it down, and there they were, the peanuts were growing underground. And they're all in clusters like that. Hey, and so I, I put them in a nice little sack and quite a big, quite a lot it was. I don't know what, I don't remember what happened to it though, <laughs> whether they took it in the school or children took it, you know. But, but that was great. <laughs> mm. 
You can still remember that joy. Oh, yeah. right. hard work that was doing. Mm -hmm. Digging and making rows of planting and things like that. Very hard work. Yeah, yeah, So you said you started duchening from the age of about 17. Yes. So you're in Israel. No. You're not in Israel? No. Oh, oh that okay. has been the, oh, moved from Israel when so I then took, what happened? took my two siblings back to India, back oh. to Bombay. Wow. To see, because the stepmother wanted to see them. Uh -huh. And my father said, bring them over, right? And then I said, I'm not coming. And he says, no, you bring them and then go back. Don't worry, after a month you can go back. But it didn't work out that way. It's just a big, long, long story there. But anyway, I took them back. And uh, instead of heading back to Israel, which I couldn't for reasons, it's a long story, I uh, I, I, my father made me a passport just saying, United Kingdom. Why I done that is because I had two brothers here already, my elder brothers. So you go to your brother. Uh, it's it's not, not a very good story on that. Okay. We'll leave that for now. So I guess had you have stayed in Israel, you would have been going to the army and you'd have probably seen some quite hectic, you know, I would have loved that. Action. I would have loved that. Did because, you want that? Because when I was in Mossad Tel Pio, we were sent to do different, we were taken to, to do different things, and one of the things was, it was in Natanya Beach, where we had sort of, it's an army kind of youth training there. It wasn't Gadna, no uh, army, but just youth training there. And I loved it. It was very hard, I, and things like that, you know, and having two different camps fighting each other, like, and trying to... It was very good, interesting, and I wouldn't have mind going into the army, mm. because I did end up in the army, but not in Israel. Okay. So, okay, so your dad makes a passport for you to go back to London, India. London, to, yeah. London to join London, your older okay, brothers. Yeah. What army did you end up going into and how? Well, and we being, that, being, that not, being that um, I was in my 16 years old when I came here to England, and I was eligible to be in the army when I'm 18, and that's where I was in the British Army. And I served at the time of Ioka in Cyprus, in the British Army. Wow. What, what, doing what? Uh, I, I was in charge of a warehouse, part of, part of a warehouse there. The warehouse was split, it's a massive, massive, you know, those big warehouses. And uh, it was split in two halves. One was the, all the things used to come to me first. And I used to sort it all out and then pass it on to the other half where they used to put in cages, everything. It's, uh, it was very interesting as well, and hard work there as well. It was all right. I was too pleased to get out of it. <laughs> How many years was that for? Two years. Two years. And then you went back to London? Yeah, well, when I finished the army, I was here. The army sent me there and brought yeah. me back here. I had to. It was in 1959 mm. that I finished with the army and came to London and uh, went and stayed with my cousin because I had nowhere else to stay. And that was it. From, from what age did you 
start duchening? Or from what age did you understand that you were a Kohen and, and what that meant? Oh, I knew I was a Kohen from very young age, but I didn't know what was entailed by being a Kohen, what was supposed to be, how important it is to be a Kohen, or it was as well. Hmm. And uh, it was many, many years before I started really getting involved in all that. I think, well, I was always in the religious side, of not very religious, but religious, but as I grew older, I went deeper into it. And I think I started doing when I was about uh, 17 years old. Wow. Right. So, so where, did and, you, where did you learn that from? Was that from? Oh, no, I knew what, it, how, how, what they're doing and things, like that, how we do the doing and all that. But uh, I didn't do it, hmm. you know, because uh, my, I was moving from one place to the other. Yeah. So there was no stable life in the start. And uh, until uh, I came really to this country, now, yes, I didn't think I came to this country and I started doing the Sephardi Shul. Mm. Interesting. So when you came to Chickwell, were you the first Sephardi in the community? Yes. Yes. I was. I don't, I don't think there was any other Sephardi here. Because by the time I was growing up in Chickwell, <laughs> in the 80s and 90s, there was a really lovely corner, which you're sitting in right now, which became known as Sephardi Corner. Quite right. Now, Sephardi Corner, was everyone somehow related somehow in Sephardi Corner? You're right. You're right. It was mainly cousins, brother-in-law and sister-in-law. <laughs> That's what you did. And then you had children, and then oh, they had yes. children, and yes. then over the Chagim it would be a very, very busy... Yes, we were, for, we were very, very family united, and we are still a very united family. And we need any little excuse to be together, which as a matter of fact, today we are going to be together, I hope, please God. Very nice. So tell me about how you then got back into Duchening in, in London, I'm supposing. Uh, well, I used to go to the Sephardi Shul in Stamford Hill. Uh, and even when our, in the East End, we, had a, we made our own little community of ours uh, called Hevre Shatz in Old Montague Street, which is demolished everything. And also Bevis Marks in the city. Right? Uh, they, they, used to have, they didn't have, with all that and the festivals, they never had any coins. They used to come to us in old Montague Street, have the shot, and I used to go there to go and do hunt for them. So you're, that's, like a, you're like a Cohen on, on demand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rent a Cohen. Yeah, that, that's how I used to do it. Mm. And that was many, many years ago. Many years ago. But in terms of, so when you were in Israel, you know, it wasn't a religious place that you, oh, yes. you were in. Oh, yes. In, in, in Moshat Talpi, it was a religious place. Ah, so you were in it a was. religious so school. So that's where I learned more down there. I see. Yeah. But do you, did you remember the Duchening from your childhood, though? Is that where you... Well, as you, when I used to go to synagogue in Bombay, as you see, yes, the Kohanim were going up there and Duchening, but they didn't, they didn't really know what exactly the meaning was all about at that time. It was too young. Mm. But your dad would go up to do it, or not? I wasn't living with my father. You were with your grandparents? Grandparents, who were not coins. Oh, they weren't coming in? No. Okay. But my father, uh, I, I don't remember him going and doing, I don't remember, maybe he did, but I don't think I was too young for all that. Mm. Interesting. And then you went to Israel. Then you went to London, then you went to Cyprus, then you went back to London, <laughs> and you joined the Sephardi community. In, oh, yes, in yes, London. yes, yes. In the, so in the East, as I said, the Hevre mm. Shatz, which we took over and done it all up, it was, because the school wasn't being used. I think it was the Federation 
mm. and uh, we took it over, done it all up, cleaned it, and we used it for quite a few years and really built a very nice community there. Isa. Isa. Baghdad version. Version. Yeah. But you picked that up in London though. I've been. And you learned that in London, that tune? Yes. Yes, you're right. You're right. Amongst, yes. Amongst yes. Although I heard I heard that tune before. But uh, it didn't mean anything much to me at all in the early days. Hmm. But as I grew along it uh, sort of uh, gone into me. And did you, did you learn stuff from your older brothers as well? Did they no. pass that on to you no. or not? No, no. They were not, they were not at all in it. Okay. Very interesting. Um, for me, growing up, you know, I wasn't aware of the differences between Ashkenazi and Sephardi. We lived in this Chigwell shul where it was all one. And we had some Khazani and Sephardi, some Kohanim Safadi, some Ashkenazi. Um, and that for me became the, the Dukhani that I just grew up loving. And I loved it. Because I always found it very spiritual. And you know I always enjoyed Simchat Torah, where we learned... Oh yes, you, we missed you on that. <laughs> we learned all of the songs from you and the other Ellis. And um, when you came to Chigwell, was it difficult that it was an Ashkenazi shul? Did you have to, no, I, did you have I, to fight I, in I, any way? Because, I, don't forget, I used to live in the East End. And before us having a community of our own Sephardi, I used to go to all the Ashkenazi shuls, like Fieldgate Street shul, right? It was a very, very nice shul, but uh, also many other shoes, the New Road, and all, all, I don't want to mention all the shoes that I, nearly everyone I've been to. Uh, but I couldn't get really into it, but I got used to it. You know, I had the Ashkenazi tunes I was, I was singing. So for me, Ashkenazi or Sephardi didn't make much uh, like, oh, cool, like that. No, all right. But, all right. You always did but I enjoy Sephardi. But you always did your tune wherever you went. Yes, yeah. but uh, but um, only thing is when I used to do the Ashkenazi ones, I used to just go a bit quiet, not as loud as they, because nowhere would they, would they accept me on doing it the way I wanted to. But Sheikh uh was tolerant, and gradually in the start they did not like it, but gradually they accepted it and started to say how nice it was. And what year did you first come to Chigwell Show? 1969. But that wasn't. But that time there was not Chigwell Show. It what? was. Uh, it was just people gathering in a house and playing. It took them a few years before they built the shoe here. Have you had ever any major complaints about your documenting? Or have there been any controversies? Yes, in the start. In the first, many, when we first started, uh, when the shul was built, mm. 
and uh, there was more people coming. Uh, there was complaint, not by the congregation, but by the Kohanim themselves, that they are not used to the way I do it, and they didn't like it. But uh, I, to, I hate to say this, that some of those Kohanim had either passed away or left the community. So this happened now that now I was getting a bit more majority. <laughs> anyway, and then people liked it. They liked it. And after that, I had no complaints at all. To me, there's no difference between Eskenazi and Sephardi. We all say the same prayers. We all believe in the same God. Eh? So what difference? A bit of he and a home. And a, and a, ah, it's all the same. One of the reasons why we decided to record this is because we found out or we realised that there were so many people that grew up in this community that didn't know Kohenim any other way other than your way. So you've left an imprint on their upbringing in Shul. How do you feel about that? I feel great. I'm glad that they are... That, look, and, I'm not unusual about this. In Israel, they do the same way as I do if you go to most, most shoes, even some, even by the Kotel, they, they do it uh, my way. So it's not like something I've come new. Uh, it has been going on for years. It's just always before, I know, I mean, in the Beta Mikdash, they should say the same. I don't know, but, uh, but it is nice. I think for me, the word I would use to describe your Dachanin, I'm one of the people that definitely was impacted by it. I would describe it as spiritual. And I think maybe that's just my feeling, but that's what I think. I, I, hope, I hope there'll be most of the congregation feeling the same as you. Mm. And I'm sure there's quite a few who really feel that way. And I think obviously during COVID, you've not been here for the Chagin. No. So people have missed out on that. Oh yes, I feel, as a matter of fact, you heard what the rabbi said this morning to me. That is uh, missing and see whether I'm coming here for the Chagin or not. But this is life, you got to go as life treats us. Yeah. What made me proud many years ago was, I don't know what exactly it was, but I was with my son who was living in Luton. And we went to the shul over there, and I felt so proud to see my son, myself, and my grandson all do healing together. I really, really felt great. So mum wants to know, if you could do your life all over again, what would you change? I wouldn't like to change anything because all that had given me a good experience of life. You know, if I didn't go through all that, I don't know, I might have been a Dumbo. But all that had given me a lot of experience. The, the main thing what had, it had done to me was to give love. To give love to my family, give love to people, give love, because I never had that. I never had that in my young age. And now that I've got a lovely family, they give me love, I give them love. They give me respect, I give them respect. And that is what I would not like to change. If it wasn't for all that, what I've had in the past, I might not have been the person I am today. How was that? Baruch atah nai Eloheinu melech ha'olam Asher kidishanu b'kdushato shel ha'aron Vesivanu levarech et amo Yisrael 
באהבה. יברך לך. Hello. 